Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with SAG AFTRA Foundation and thank you so much for tuning in to watch another one of our conversations at home videos today. Um, before we kick into today's conversation, I want to continue reminding everyone watching these videos that as a nonprofit organization, we're continuing to raise money for a COVID-19 fund. This is working to support actors who are out of work with all of the film and television productions that are closed right now. So please check out the details below this video and consider supporting if you're able to in any way as it's really helping people with paying bills, buying groceries, anything that they need to get by day, day by day. Um, today we are incredibly fortunate to be joined by the wonderful Peter Gallagher and Mary Steenburgen to talk about Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, which just got announced for season two pickup. So congratulations, first off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Of course, I know so many people were, were excited. The internet was, was on fire with it. And I wanted to start by asking you a little bit about your history with music, Mary, because ever since I saw Wild Rose, um, the amazing indie film that came out and learned your story about having had a surgery that, that caused your brain to think differently after going under anesthesia and really hear things musically and how that led to, you know, a journey into songwriting to this point where you've written hundreds of songs, in, including the, the main one from that film. Um, and I just wanted to kind of ask about how that made you think really differently about your character in terms of connectivity to the material that you were working on, and particularly in the scenes that you share with Jane Levy, where she's seen your character through her own experience of kind of what you really understand in a way that probably no one else can on that show. Well, first of all, thank you for saving me trying to explain what happened to me musically because you just did it so much more succinctly than I've ever done it. So I appreciate that. And I might actually memorize what you've said so I can do it more efficiently next time because it's a crazy story, but I, I also make it way too long. Um, in terms of playing Maggie, the, it was certainly what drew me my uh, uh, beyond fascination. It's kind of an uh, obsessiveness regarding music, which is a happy obsessiveness. I'm, I'm very used to it now because the event happened in 2007 where, uh, you know, just a normal surgery and my brain had some sort of reaction to the anesthetic that either opened up something, we're not sure what happened, but music, my, my brain became like an overscored uh, movie. So, so anything to do with music is fascinating and compelling to me. And the weird thing is that, is that since that happened, musical, uh, stories, movies, things like that also seem to present themselves in my life. So I guess it was all meant to be. But in terms of Maggie, um, I don't, unlike Peter and Alex Newell and Skylar Aston and really every other member of the cast, I don't really consider myself a singer. I do consider myself a songwriter, but not necessarily a singer, but part of why I wanted to do this was to get over the fear of expressing myself through song and um, and to just get better at it, just for, for me and, and to add something to this beautiful story that, um, uh, that Austin Winsberg was creating. So uh, part of it was just hard work, working with vocal coaches and singing constantly and singing on the way to work in the car by myself and in the rain in Vancouver. <laughs> and, um, and talking about singing all the time with Peter and, and other people. And, and part of it was just really grounding myself in the truth that my whole life I've told stories. That's what we do as actors. And the song really is that too. And that I don't have to separate it. I, I will never sing like some of these guys do, but I can sing in my storytelling voice. And so that that became um, that became my little hill to climb. Yeah, and as as Mary mentioned, Peter, obviously you have extensive an extensive background and and so much experience in musical theater. But I was interested in the way that you had to think about your performance very differently for this show. You know, even down to the choreography and and the performance that you're giving, because you're not sending that performance out to a 
wide room full of people. It's really an intimate gathering of, of those larger emotions for, for a camera rather than an audience. And so how did that force you to think about choreography and music performances in a very different way to when you've done theater and, and prepare differently as well? Well, in a way, you know, it's for me, it's all the same kind of preparation. Um, people have asked me about the stage. Or the, it's just where you're, who you're reaching. If I'm reaching somebody two feet away, or if I'm communicating with somebody two, it's going to be different if I'm communicating to somebody f further. But what Mary said was absolutely right on the money, which is why I just adore working with Mary and the whole cast. We share a background. We've had this one of the same teachers, acting teachers, Bill Esper. Um, mm -hmm. And there is... There is no, and there's nothing easier than doing a scene with Mary because she just, she tells the truth. She sets it up. And, it, and the same is this true with the songs. It's just another, it's like a monologue with music. And you have to understand what it is you're expressing, you know, specifically. And so when you're, if, when you're really keyed into trying to understand what it is you're trying to communicate, the notes are important, the other stuff is important, but if you can sort of find that that if find the right thing find find the the thing you want to express and do it successfully it, it these are great songs and they'll they'll really help you communicate um so i didn't really see any difference one one you're out on a stage and it's different cuz it's like being outside almost and and this with zoe it was uh she was right there or I could only do so much. And uh, it was just, I think, a credit to Austin Winsberg for having, first of all, have, having written musicals so he understands the relationship between word, music, and story. Having lived with a father who had what I had and lived this story, so it was very specific. And he's a wonderful writer. So between the hit songs and the wonderful scenes, for me, it was just, I just really was, really didn't, really wanted to, I didn't know if I'd ever get another chance to do all those things in another scene like that. And I just didn't want to screw it up. And, uh, and with Mary, it just made it so easy. <laughs> yeah. And the two of you craft their marriage on screen so beautifully. And you're, you're expressing this marriage of, of over 40 years and there's such a richness and such a history, which is a huge challenge given that you know, Peter's not talking the majority of the time. So the only moment that you really have- perfect have... marriage. <laughs> my wife, oh my I God. I wish I had that. She is so jealous of Mary. Oh, Mary, you don't even say anything, but with me, blah, blah, blah. She doesn't, she doesn't say that, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Honey. Oh. <laughs> so speeding into the room. But I imagine that there's a really interesting dynamic and, and challenge to that because the only time that, that you're both really kind of fully exchanging with each other physically and, and through words is actually through the music scenes that you share together. So there's really that one snapshot moment to, to capture the richness and, and that history. So I was curious about how you, how you thought about approaching that and how you really wanted to be able to express all of that in such small moments, particularly since you still don't have dialogue in those scenes to express it. Well, the great thing is Mary came up with the song, perfect, for that, for that, that song that we do together and, and sing. And I think that was huge because I didn't really know the song. And, uh, and to Austin's credit, again, he, he completely embraced it. And so, again, it was like the perfect song. And, and there, you couldn't ask for more in terms of a buildup. You know, that if we, had had, if we had, had played our cards right and did our job as actors, somewhat successfully up until then it was just the i mean it was also just something the two of us wanted to see mitch and maggie to see mitch and maggie before all this happened you know the the, the mitch that we didn't know and the maggie with mitch that we hadn't seen and and um and it was just so gratifying to see how 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 much our audience, a lot of our audience appreciated that, even for people who had lost people who hadn't, didn't have a chance to really grieve at the time, or uh, just to confirm what they suspected about Mitch and Maggie. And, uh, anyway. Yeah, it was, it was so interesting doing 
have building an on-screen relationship with someone who couldn't speak, you know, and part of it, I mean, of course, a large part of it just began with Austin's heart and the real life thing that he experienced in losing his father to PSP. But part of it, and part of it is the alchemy of casting that Peter and I, who had somehow managed to never work together all these years, ended up working together twice in two weeks in different things. We, we play exes on um, uh, Grace, and uh, Jane, Grace and Frankie on Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin's show. And, um, and then within two weeks, they said, they said, uh, guess who we think we're going to have play Mitch? And I knew before they said it, they were going to say Peter, because it was just, there was something in the air about us working together. And so the fact that we just have a lot in common and, you know, from our kids and our marriages and our, our histories and our parents a little um, bit. What? Even our parents a little bit. Even just our that parents generous, a little you know? bit. And um, so it just, it, that felt natural. And then I think what happened was my imagination, in my imagination, I could see the marriage that had been there, had always been there. And it was so, so even in the scenes where we couldn't speak to each other or we weren't dancing or singing, I did feel this like, um, completeness of who these people were. It wasn't just like, a, oh, this is frustrating that we can't talk and illuminate this. I felt like it was there 100%, even without those words. And so, so it, was, it was an interesting and unique experience because most of the time you learn about your characters through the things they say. But in this case, it was really what you could feel that they felt, you know, and um, and the music just supported that. So, and the dance, we have Mandy Moore who, you know, she doesn't approach dance like, oh, you need to be <laughs> a dancer and start doing this foreign thing. You approach dance completely out of what you're feeling. And so, you know, the, it's, it's about, there is no difference between what you're feeling and what your body is telling the world that you're feeling. She connects that so completely that, um, that it all felt seamless. And even for somebody like me who, you know, was at this late date of my life starting to do a whole lot of things for the first time, it was much less scary in reality than how I'd worried about it ahead of time. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask you both a little bit more about the collaboration with Mandy Moore and the choreography because she's so astounding in the way that she really thinks about telling a story through character and the way that movement lends itself to story as opposed to it really just being about the moves. And, and I was interested in if she would like sit with you at all beforehand and have conversations about your character and, and the place that they were in, in in developing that choreography, or was it really her just working off of the scripts to, to craft that? Well, you're not really sitting for one minute. <laughs> you just dive in, don't you, Peter, and start. Yeah. You know, she does ask you, what are you, what are you feeling? What do you think you're going through right here? And, and you're just in it from that question on. You're, you're, she starts moving and you start moving. And it just, it's, you know, it really is like alchemy. It really it's, it's is. It's a beautifully, her choreography is so beautifully integrated into to the direction of the, of the show. It's not like, all right, we have the acting and now we got the dance number. Yeah. So, and it's never, believe me, I, I am not a dancer. Because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like a two and a half thread. If I, I, I can sing a little, I can act a little, and if I have enough rehearsal, I can move okay. But I am not a dancer, and I have been in such, I have failed so spectacularly in dance situations in the past that all I have to hear is, all right, five, six, seven, eight, and my, you know, <laughs> all my bodily functions cease and I pass out. Cause just, but with Mandy, it's like, like she's the director. You know, she's like, we're painting it as we go along, and she can see what, 
She knows what we're capable of. She's not going to ask me to do stuff that Skylar or Alex or John or any of the guys that can really, really sing and dance um, do. But we, but that doesn't matter because what we're trying to, she's, she's, she's discovering our, our vocabulary mm -hmm. and what way in which we can express those things effectively, not setting a, perf a standard of perfection and expecting us to reach it. But again, it's like a song. It doesn't matter if it's perfect. Perfection is overrated. But if we can find some way to, you know, support the choices we've made in the lyric, you know, with, with what we're doing, and if it comes out and people are moved by it, you know, it's it's then it was then it was perfect. <laughs> well, right, right, um, because it was lifelike, which is not perfect, which yeah. is what we respond to, you know. And and so we had a really just a really it's a really lovely bunch all the way. We know when we get together for these zooms, you know, I'm such a I'm I had the fun, weirdest thing yesterday after we had this had the zoom. Uh, in the afternoon, somebody said something about a song, and I went on Spotify, and I hadn't really seen the Zoe's playlist thing. And I started to listen to the, everybody's songs and stuff. I was like a basket case. I was like, I was, I was hiding in the pantry, and I, I was hiding in the pantry in our kitchen. <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> I mean, you know, it just made me feel so lucky that it was that that we were able to be, you know, part of that. Yeah, I mean, you're crying in the pantry was everyone's experience watching the show. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no, I totally identify because I read the tweets now, and, and uh, but just and also the music is just so good. It's just and Harvey Mason Jr. who produced the track. Wow! Yeah. Oh my God! Oh my yeah. God! I mean, really, all these wonderful people that made us feel comfortable and able to do things, you know, and, and within such a short amount of time. It was cool. Yeah. Well, similarly to, to kind of the process with the choreography, that kind of brings me to something else I was curious about, which was, you know, working with Harvey and with Eric Vitro, who's your vocal coach, and, and the work that you would do, because a lot of the songs you would pre-record, but sometimes you would still sing them, sing them live on set. But in terms of that pre-record, what the work is that you would do for yourselves and, and with that team in order to kind of really think about where your character was going to be in the scene, because you haven't filmed it yet. And obviously, usually when you're filming a scene, there's so many different directions that you can try in different places places that that scene can go in the moment. But I was interested in, in kind of, if you had to make more solid choices ahead of time when you were pre-recording the music. That's a really good question. I, you know, the work with Eric for me, because I, again, felt like I, this was, this was such a new language for me that he really, for me, helped me to just, supporting voice and to really even he he was so great about psychologically helping me to understand I could do this and and got very militant with me about me ever saying I couldn't do it <laughs> and um actually if you want to erase the part where I think I said in this interview that I'm not really a singer that would be make Eric Vitra very happy but um but I learned so much from him and that, and there was that basis. And then, and then it's like really the relationship between Peter and I and between Jane and I and, um, and Andrew Lee's character and myself and the, these relationships building was another huge and so by the time you went to sing this song, it wasn't just music anymore. Again, it was like, oh, I'm going to go tell, I'm going to go say what Maggie is feeling right now. And the, the conceit for those people who haven't seen Zoe's is that Jane Levy uh, herself has some uh, a kind of medical moment that allows her, unlike myself, she, she hears other people's music. So she hears... The music of their heart. So maybe they're they're 
acting really happy, but she hears the song Mad World, um, as is true of one character, because that's what he's going through. And so, um, so those songs are already chosen to support what our heart is feeling. And so it's really a question of as an actor that you sing that song in the recording booth the way you feel like it, it's coming from your heart. And it's an interesting challenge because you, you are often several days away from actually performing it and doing it. But Peter told me, and it was true, he said, always make sure you're singing uh, with, your, with your recordings so that A, it can be used, but also that you're breathing, that you're, and that you're, you know, and it's, it's so much more um, connected that way than if you're just doing some dumb thing where you're moving your mouth, but you're not really singing. So uh, it, was, it was fascinating. And, it, and, um, and I, I felt, I, lo I, loved, I loved it. I love learning something new at my age. I love, I love being a beginner. I love being humble about it, you know? And I've sung a little bit in movies. Um, but never anything like this. And I had never sung um, harmony till we sang perfect. <laughs> and I was so freaked out about it. I thought, uh, how will I do this? I know I'm going to just start singing the melody, but I did it. I sang harmony with Peter. <laughs> I was so happy I could be your first harmony. <laughs> Amir, um, and meanwhile, I'm a huge fan of Eric Vitros. He's a wonderful, wonderful teacher, and I love all his students, especially yeah. Mary Steenburgen. <laughs> but I had been studying with another voice teacher for the past 26 years, Joan Later, a teacher in New York. So I didn't, you know, I just used the same warm-up every day. I tried to sing every day and use the same warm-up I've been using. Actually, it's a little newer warm-up. This one's only five years old. I could hear you because we have the same trailer <laughs> that's divided into two parts. <laughs> it's so funny, too, because I try to be so quiet, you know, because you get shy. It's like even in your apartment, you know, you know, you're doing all your vocalizing and stuff, but by the same token, if you don't do it, you'll be done. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so in terms of pre preparing those songs, it was amazing how little you know songs that you've heard a lot of times until you have to sing them. And then just, you know, getting into understanding what the songwriter meant and seeing, understanding what that phrase was, understanding specifically what that meant. And, and then, frankly, after singing with jo studying with Joan for 26, six, seven years, I remember, it was, it's like all of my great teachers, my acting teacher I studied with for longer than that, I think. But uh, the stuff that you start to learn just seems impossible. And I realize that some of the stuff that I've been trying to learn for 26 years with Joan took me 26 years. <laughs> and there was a couple of songs I was finally able to kind of do it on in this. And, uh, and just what Mary said, I think it's what I love most about what we do is because we get to just learn these things that and have these experiences that we shouldn't necessarily be entitled to, but we get the many, we get to record and sing and dance and, or I think Marcello Mastriani called it uh, being a luxury tourist, where you don't just, you know, visit the Eiffel Tower, you have lunch with the guy who cuts the grass underneath it. You know, in the same way, we don't just get to sing a song, we get to go and record the song with Harvey Mason Jr. And you know, <laughs> get to sing it, stuff with Alex Newell and Skylar Aston and, and, uh, and dance. You know, honestly, my wife still shakes. Her. My wife was a real dancer and her mother was a real dancer. And she's a real dancer and she just, she still shakes her head when she sees me trying to dance. And, and so we have these marvelous, uh, experiences and I feel very much the way Mary does it's it's what I love it's just like uh okay what are we gonna what are we gonna learn about today yeah and Mary one of the specific scenes that I wanted to ask you about was was those final moments of the finale with, with you know that seven minute uninterrupted one camera shot performance of American Pie it's so stunningly crafted and, and so specifically choreographed and so I was really interested in how you kind of 
go into a scene like that and prepare for a scene like that because you have to be so specifically focused on being in the right place and and you in particular are kind of the guiding force for where the camera is moving throughout that entire scene for the majority of the time but at the same time you're still giving such a harrowingly emotional performance at the same time so how did you kind of balance those those two elements and, and really think about the way that you were going to step into it to make sure that it it flowed in the way that it ultimately did well Again, kudos to uh, uh, to uh, Austin and to uh, uh, all the people who, John Turtletop and all the people uh, who were a part of, um, of doing, just even choosing that song. And um, I remember hearing that Austin was really thinking about it and um, and he realized the lyrics that if you if you tried to take them very literally it might not make sense and yet when you watch it 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 not only makes sense for the situation but it begins to make sense for each and every character to sing what they're singing it's really fascinating how that worked a lot of that was Mandy figuring out uh, where uh, people should go and Adam Davidson was very instrumental in in making all this work so beautifully and um, but one of the coolest things about it and actually if people are interested watch it very carefully not so much those of us who are on camera singing but that was supposed to take place over about seven hours and it's the beginning of of awake and people arriving through, uh, it's all cleaned up at the end. So to me, some of the stars of the of that seven minute unbroken steady cam shot, besides um, Bradley, our amazing steady cam operator, and Emma, who was holding him and walking backwards. Um, besides that, were the pro the people who did the props who laid out an entire feast in the beginning of the shot and in the middle of the shot there's less and then at the end of the shot it's cleaned up and the way and people literally I said to Austin that day and I hope they did it I said you've got to have a video of what everyone is doing because I would run to go be in a certain position before the camera could be on me and I would pass literally people <laughs> lying down on their backs behind the cabinet so they wouldn't be seen and then they pop up and carry a tabletop <laughs> off and I mean every single person that played a background person in that had something they had to carry or do or move um, if you look closely everybody that's pretty much been in the series all season um, from Peter's doctor to friends that drop by when um, when I sing this song how to mend a broken heart all those people are in that shot. And so there's so much, there's so much to it. And we spent an entire, I think it was, I can't remember if it was, I think it was a Monday that we, all we did that day was rehearse that shot. And I've never had that luxury on anything I've ever done of spending an entire day rehearsing this one shot. And um, I believe that take is the seventh take um it might be the sixth austin would have to tell you but it it was just after it was over we all felt so good and then it turned out everybody everybody in every department said i felt really good on that and so that was that was it the only thing that was missing was that peter wasn't there <laughs> because we all we all well first of all you know, I, I mean, um, how everyone on that set felt about him was a big part of all those last episodes, how we felt about him as a man and an actor and a person. So, so that was in all those last episodes. It was truly uh, heartbreaking, you know, and then I think that's partly what people feel when they watch this because this came out at a time when the whole world was heartbroken 
and people are losing people and people are having to protect each other by staying inside or contemplating their, you know, the fact that they could die and, and how much they love their family and love life. And all of these are the themes of this, this and, and how we treat each other racially and, and what we are to each other um, and how we've been unfair and unkind to each other. These huge themes in life happened as this thing was coming out that was really um, about so much of this, the music of our life, both heartbreaking and uplifting. And so it was, it was just a really interesting experience being a part of it. Yeah. And then Peter, I wanted to ask you um, about the unique physicality of, of your performance the majority of the time. I know that you did a massive amount of research into, into PSP and you obviously at Austin there is an amazing resource and, and I believe maybe there's a technical advisor who was on set with you as well. But I was interested in kind of how you culminated all of that research into even just the thing about thinking about how he would be sitting when you're just sitting there throughout a scene, how his muscles would hold, how you're breathing in each moment, because you don't just have to capture it in one iteration, you're capturing the deterioration of his body throughout the season, and, and you do it so well and manage to convey so much while doing such tiny, tiny, nuanced things. And so I was just interested in how you kind of culminated the research and the performance aspect and really pulled that all together. Well, I did, you know, I, I did research. The, good, the thing about PSP is it finds different expressions slightly in different people. So it's not a completely specific, um, it's a, like a Parkinsonian disease. And, uh, and my mother had Alzheimer's for 20 years. So I was very uh, familiar with people who were, who were no longer able to express themselves, but full of expression. And that you, you know, if you stay with somebody long enough, you get confirmation that what you suspect might be in, you know, I've told this story before, that w the last three words my mom let, let go of before all words left her completely. If I, you know, if I was singing to her or dan holding her or dancing with her, she'd say, oh, that was real. And I just knew that, you know, I could see how her body would respond to people in the room that I knew that she, they had an issue with a little weirdness. And so I just felt that everything was still functioning. It's just, it's like wearing a mask. It's like there was something preventing the expression of it. So I, and the fact that Austin lived with it, I just knew that if I was really way off base, base he'd say something. And, uh, and uh, I just kind of kind of went with it. And physically, you know, I read that it was physically it was a little tough because you, you have a kind of a rigidity, a rigidity in certain areas of your body. Uh, it's just, you know, what an actor does. You learn what you have to do physically and emotionally and, and then try not to screw it up. <laughs> and then sing and dance and then get back to it. You go, what? How's that? Yeah, that's good. Okay. <laughs> and then just, you know, given how much the show really talks about and speaks to the moments of connectivity and communication that happen outside of dialogue, you know, in those quiet, more nuanced moments, I was curious if, if the two of you have kind of taken anything away from that experience and if, it, if it's evolved the way that you think about communication in between the things that we say to each other in day-to-day -day life since making the show. Well, I'm just, if I get just two seconds on, on what Mary was saying, um, which I think is so important, and that what really drew me to this show was the fact that it was about all that does connect us. And we were in this bizarre world where, you know, the president and people were trying to divide us for power and political gain. And... And you start questioning everything. You start questioning yourself and, you know, and looking at other people out of the side of your eye, whatever. And here was a show that was just all about what can I, these ex human experiences that we all share. It doesn't matter whether you're tall or short or, you know, what color you are, whatever, that we share. And these wonderful hit songs that we all know that already reside in us. And so 
it was such a privilege to be having told this story about connection, about all the things that connect us. As Mary was saying, when this coronavirus hit, and then, because and during this period of time, the show to be so reassuring because all of a sudden, amidst all the lies and half-truths that we've been hosed down with, there were a couple of things that emerged in the last few months that you just can't argue with, that are just simple facts. Here's a virus. It doesn't care what you believe in, but it can kill you. And we have to change our behavior. And guess what? Black lives matter. There's no way avoiding this anymore. This is not a, an imagined thing. This is a real thing. And so it was encouraging that our show could give comfort to all sorts of people that were feeling disconnected. And, um, and, uh, and it's also really reassuring to see how we as a nation seem to be way ahead of our leaders in terms of evolving and in terms of being unafraid of change and unafraid of where we all have to go. There's nothing more powerful than a, a whole younger population that is not being served by the economy and that can go out there and, and be bold and, you know, and, and say what has to be said. So to, to provide any kind of comfort at a time like this, it's like, yes, this is what I love more than anything, being part of stories that, that you know, is, well, what, when you're on the stage, and if a moment works, for a moment, nobody feels alone. And for a moment, we all feel like we're part of the same human race. And that's what I feel about this show. And, and, uh, and I'm so lucky that, that, to, that, that, to, that to be part of it and that the audience has embraced it in a way that I, I was really hoping they might. I wholeheartedly agree with everything you were, were saying then. And, and thank you so much, both of you, for, for taking time to talk about the show. And I'm going to go obsessively watch the American Pie scene about five times now and try to catch all those things you were mentioning. And yeah, stay, stay there's so there. much there. There's so much uh, beyond just who's, who's got that part of the song that I hope people will watch. And, and just the little miracle of, you know, you have to picture it that amazing camera operator is moving backwards the entire time. It was really extraordinary. I was so proud. I was proud of every single person there. It felt really cool to be a part of that team. Yeah, it's, you know, every single dance number, there was another dancer in that, one or two dancers in that number you never saw. One was Bradley Crosby. And the other was Emma, his, his first AC, pulling focus and making sure he didn't fall off a ledge or do anything else. And every move we had, Bradley would be there, this tall, wonderful, extraordinary man, and with this heavy machinery wrapping around walls and behind <laughs> us and around, making us look great. They were amazing. They were amazing. I, 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 I remember a shot where I actually got some mesmerized watching her guide him. <laughs> That I, I forgot where, the, oh yeah, I actually am on camera. But um, yeah, they were, uh, they and there were, guys, there were guys pulling during that shot, by the way, pulling the gigantic curtains to make day from night at a certain point and changing the light. There's so much going on that is, is just a part of the miracle of what, our business is, you know, that we actors often steal so much focus, but the joy of it for us is that, you know, we're all pulling up that circus tent together. And it was yeah. that you really felt it on that show so many, so many times. It's amazing. And I love, I love how much you both love the experience of, of working on this show. And I hope that we get many more seasons of it. Thank you. Thank you.